from the studios of Hub Radio Phoenix, it's the Jay Lawrence Show. Now, here's Jay. I love that. I love the applause. I am so glad you're here tonight. Thank you for letting us once again be part of your television viewing. We are very pleased to welcome as our guest this evening, Thayer Bershur. Now we're going to talk to Thayer about ASRA, Arizona Republican Assembly. But in order to do that, first we've got to meet Thayer and find out an incredible background going back to uh, the Trump administration. All right, let's start with the, the Trump administration, I think 2016? 2016, I was the deputy director for the campaign here in Arizona. So, yeah, and uh, against all odds, with a person who had a fantastic and huge personality, got elected to be the president of the United States, and I had the opportunity to go back to Washington and work with him. Campaign <laughs> one, all right, now let's talk about what happened then. Uh, you went on to become the director of veterans administration or yes or no so after after the uh, election was over they asked if we wanted to go back to dc and i said absolutely i'd love to go back there and work and so when, when i first got back there i actually started out on the beachhead team at the department of agriculture and at the department of agriculture i was working on a rural infrastructure project and mostly i was kind of putting together some ideas about how we could move forward with the rural broadband uh, and the connectivity out into the rural areas of, of the country. And being a kid who was born and raised down in the Yuma area and grew up out and, you know, went to a high school with 350 kids and graduated with a class of 83, I was kind of familiar with the, the rural area. So that, that was a great experience. And then after six months, I had the opportunity to go over and work at the, at the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, and be their executive uh, be on the be the deputy assistant secretary of their intergovernmental affairs and so, so talk about that yeah so that was a really great opportunity for me because as you know I was I, was, I served in the Arizona State Senate for eight years right. and so I was able to take that experience and those people who I met you know because you know when you're, when you're you, there's a lot of conferences you go to so you you meet a lot of you network with a lot of other legislators and uh, across the country as well. So having the opportunity to work at the Intergovernmental Affairs, basically our, we covered all the governments in the, country, in, in the country and outside the country that weren't Congress. So we covered state, local, county. We, we covered tribal governments. Uh, we we uh, arranged international visits as dignitaries would come in from other countries. So, you know, we had a great opportunity to work really closely with our with people, for, you know, mayors and governors and and legislators, and and so that was a fantastic. There, how were you treated, for example, by people with whom you'd worked uh, in our legislature? When you moved to Washington, did they treat you like good old third? Oh, I remember. <laughs> or did they say, ah, "Look who's there"? No, I think you know. I I I, uh, I I maintain a lot of those contacts. A lot of people that I worked with were there, um, you know, actually I'd been out of the legislature for several years before I, before I went back there, because right. I got out of the legislature in 2011. And so I kind of had, had a bit of a distance between being in the legislature and going back to DC. But, you know, I worked with a lot of people because a lot of those legislators had moved on to other areas. Some were sup served on county board of supervisors, some served in other positions. And so, you know, I still worked with them and so, yeah, it was it was a it was a great opportunity. I, I tell people, I said it was like being in the it was, it was it was very similar to being in the legislature. I wasn't voting on any type of policy or legislation, but I was able to work with a lot of the same people that you work with when you're in the legislature. I guess Thayer for sure. Thayer, what when you say I worked with, what were some of the accomplishments? What were the, what does worked with them mean? So a lot of the things that we did was we would help uh, sit, there were, there, there were um, cities that wanted to have outpatient clinics. So the VA does what they call community outpatient clinics, or CBOCs for short, right? And so those are the things that 
uh, that veterans can go to that they don't have to go all the way into a medical center. They're kind of w closer to the, where the veterans live. So a lot of communities were trying to get through some of the zoning issues and through some of the permitting processes and working with us to make sure they were getting all that kind, proper kind of information. So we did a lot of that. One of the probably the biggest things that I worked on back there was veteran suicide prevention. So, you know, we have a we have we lose 20 veterans a day to suicide. Really? Yeah. And so it's it, it's very tragic. But, you know, we were able to work with the president and he put together a, a, a roadmap to end veteran suicide. And so uh, we worked with several of the other agencies like like HUD, for instance, because one of the problems is homeless veterans and that leads to a problem. We worked with, you know, health services because a lot of veterans have ad addiction problems. And so those things are also problematic. And so we, we worked with faith-based organizations. One of the things I worked with as part of my job in intergovernmental affairs was to work with faith-based organizations. And so one of the things that it, the studies show is that veterans that are involved in the faith community are less likely to commit suicide because they have a network that's built up around them, a support sure. network. And so that was really important, that important work to bring all those people together to work on a solution to help bring the number of suicides down. Did it work? Well, it's working right now. Yes. So, I mean, you know, this was done in the last in, and was rolled out in 2000 at the beginning of 2020, right before everything kind of got shut down with COVID. COVID didn't exactly help the problem because one of the problems for veterans that commit suicide is isolation. And so that didn't help. Um, and we're seeing that now, you know, and those and there's studies showing that. I mean, that's one of the problems with the whole a lot of the policies around shutting everything down is it leads to this isolation. And so we see, you know, we, we, we were even seeing before I left, before the, uh, the president's term ended, you know, upticks in child abuse and spousal abuse, you know, domestic abuse situations going on. And those things exacerbate the problem with, with that veterans have when they, when they get home. When I was in the legislature, you know, I was chairman of the Veterans Committee in the House. And I spoke frequently about you and the work you did and the suicide rate. And the fact that I urged people to yep. call the veteran in the neighborhood and just say hello, was that one of the things you, you found enthusiastic? Yeah, yes. And that was one of the things that we um, talked about and was part of the plan was as for, so for instance, Veterans don't really like to go admit, you know, they don't talk about being veterans. Right. They, they like to, they kind of come home and they just want to be a part of something, but they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be necessarily singled out. And so one of the things that we urged, like faith-based organizations, and we worked with mayors in, and county uh, local, local governments to really kind of work to identify the veterans in their community and one of the things that's important is not just identifying I mean saying hi and 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 you know asking them how they're doing it is important but what veterans won't really want to be able to do is they want to be able to get out in the community and serve the community I mean right. veterans are way. veterans veterans joined the military because they want to serve the country and so that's what they want to do they want to serve and so one of the things that really helps veterans get back into the community and integrate back into the community and and avoid suicidal tendencies is getting involved in and in giving service back to the community because that's what they do did you find particular communities that were especially helpful in this regard well you know we one of the great things about working at the va is everybody wants to i mean everybody loves our veterans sure so you know it was so easy to work with all of our, all of the communities all over. I, you know, I wouldn't say one was necessarily better than another. There were some mayors that made it their task to end veteran homelessness. And so while I was there, uh, I worked with our homeless program, our veterans homeless program, to end veteran homelessness. And we had several cities that were commi committed and, and achieved zero veteran homelessness now it's a functional zero because you can't house everybody because not everybody wants to be housed 
but functionally they got to what what uh, uh, HUD calls functional zero. So, Fair. Yeah. How has COVID, the COVID epidemic, affected the veteran community as much as anyone else? Well, I, like I like I said earlier, one of the issues with the COVID problem was the isolationism. So, you know, that's one of the signs is when a veteran starts to isolate themselves. That that is a warning, a, a warning flag. And so, you know, when COVID struck and they started shutting everything down and telling people to stay home, that that was a bit of a problem. And so, I think that was important that people really reached out. And so. You know, but veteran service organizations like, you know, the VFW and, and the American Legion and disabled veterans and a lot of churches, uh, a lot of a lot of the communities really stepped up their game in reaching out to veterans and, and making sure they were OK. You talked about organizations like VFW uh, and other veterans groups. They became well, they're very important now, but they became even more important. And in fact, now. Some of them are refusing, many are refusing to do masking and, um, and stay clear of them. And that, that's good for veterans. It is good for veterans. I, you know, I, you know, you know pe people want to mask, they should mask. And, and, and an organization, most of the organizations, I think, have done a really good job in, in saying, you know what, the decision is your decision. you got to decide what's best for you. And that's where you have to, and, that, and that's one of the things that help veterans integrate back into is, is they're empowered to make decisions. When peop, decisions start being made for people, that, co that becomes problematic. So mandates aren't as helpful as education. And, and we found this through the years with, with almost everything. For, for whatever reason, the government always wants to give its heavy hand, you know, to mandate to make people do what's right. Well, you know, you're going to have better participation. You're going to have higher success rates when people voluntarily make those choices based upon what they what they learn and you know the science isn't necessarily supporting all of these mask mandates and vaccine mandates right and so that's a pro that's a problem I guess there for sure one of your other jobs chief of staff for the Arizona Republican Party let's talk about that sure well what do you want to know <laughs> Sounds be, like being dude, chief, that was being, a great job. Being, being chief of staff was, was a very uh, exciting job. Uh, of course, you know, you're working in a very partisan uh, field, but when you have majority in the state. So one of the great, one of the accomplishments that we had when I was the chief of staff for the first time, and, and unfortunately the only time in the history of the state, we elected for, to every state office from governor to the corporation commission, state mine inspector, both the senators were all elected, and both of our U.S. senators. So all those statewide offices were held by Republicans. We had a majority in the House, and we had a majority in the Senate. That was that was that was an, a great accomplishment. A lot of people forget that up until Barry Goldwater, Arizona was predominantly a Democrat-controlled state, and then Barry Goldwater came along and 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 kind of started turning around things. When I when I grew up in down in Yuma, my parents were Democrats. When I registered when when I graduated from high school in in '79, I reg, I voted for Ronald Reagan as a Democrat. And then and then I joined the army. And in and in '80 '84, I I switched parties and I voted for him the second time around as a as a Republican. But you know, that's when, you know, R Ronald Reagan kind of shifted and Barry Goldwater kind of shifted the state to, to be in a, a red state. And so, but for years we had never controlled all the statewide officers and offices until uh, Tom Morrissey and I were, he was the chairman of the party. And, but then the by the next cycle, we, uh, we started losing some of those seats again. We still see Tom around frequently. Yeah, Tom's running the, running the, he's the mayor up in the town of, Payson, right, which is a beautiful, right. beautiful town, and I don't blame him for living up there. <laughs> when, when did we change? When did all of a sudden, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about your job as as a president, but when did this start changing from a Republican state to now it's questionable? Now, hopefully, that's going to change because Biden has done such a screwed up job. Hopefully it'll change. 
Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, we kind of the same thing happened when he was the vice president and Obama was the president. What they did with Obamacare and so many of the policies in the in the in the Middle East were were disastrous. And you know, when under Obama we saw the caliphate grow, and and all the brutality that came along with that. And uh, as soon as and so you know, a lot of people were just tired of those those policies that weren't in, weren't enforcing our laws to protect our border. Weren't let, let me interrupt you for yeah. a second. We'll get back to this. Thayer Vashur is our guest. I'm Jay Lawrence. I'm glad you're here tonight. You have a great business, terrific products, outstanding services. So where is everybody? It's simple. They don't know you're here. Why not? We didn't tell them. Well, let me introduce you to the Media Maven. She is the expert in getting your advertising message to the right people in the right places for the right prices. She can make your business a household name. She can make this claim because she's been doing this for years for large and small businesses. You need an expert who knows who to talk to and how to make the best deal for your business. She has the right radio and television contacts for your budget, whatever it is. That's Kathy, the media maven. She can put you on the map, the one that leads to success and prosperity. Call Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. That's Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. Roof work, people ask, Do you know a guy? Let me save you a little time and money. Call me. I'm Lori Clark, owner of Right Way Roofing. Our family started in the roofing business in 1963 on the promise there's only one way the right way. We protect your roof with thick, waterproof, rubberized asphalt, not felt paper. So when it's time to repair or replace your roof and you need a guy, I'm your girl. We're right Way Roofing, we do it right. We'll always keep you water tight. This is a commercial for an auto dealership. Well, not really. It's a commercial for a salesperson at an auto dealership. The dealership is Wright Toyota on Frank Lloyd Wright. The salesperson is Jason Carter. I want you to remember that name, Jason Carter. My wife and I have bought our last six autos from him. I've sent relatives and friends to see Jason at Wright Toyota. If you're financing, Jason will work with the finance department to get you the lowest payments. Jason, here's what you're looking for. He knows what's there on the grounds. He knows where to find the exact automobile for which you're looking. And there's no time limit to his service. So there's no insistence that you buy the automobile he shows you. If it's a new Toyota or a formerly owned auto, any brand, any label, please call Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. Our guest is Thayer Vershoor. We were talking about what happened to to the Republican Party, and I know we'll get into this more because you are working at bringing it back, but what happened all of a sudden with the Obama administration? Well, it so became far more Democrat. It, 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 it started... I mean, again, if you go back to the history of Arizona, this, it's kind of, you know, been a back and forth. But we, like I said, when I was the uh, chief of staff for the Republican Party is when we finally reached our zenith there. Um, and it's still a battle. And unfortunately, what we've seen is I'm not, sh you know, I, I, think, I think what's going to be important is, is that we secure our elections. You know, there. This was a this was a problematic situation in. We're supposed to get a report tomorrow. Yeah. I think from the committee examining, and that committee had better show what we expect. Well, I think it's more important that they show what the truth is. Yes. You know, it's not really necessarily what we expect because what we expect is the truth, and that's what everybody in this state wants, including Democrats. Not maybe not all the elected Democrats, and maybe some of those. People who are, you know, have a vested interest, but uh, you know, having all these drop boxes, having election tallying that goes on for days and days and days, uh, there is that is problematic, and that needs that needs to be addressed, and that personally that needs to end. You know, we need to 
when I was in the legislature, we made sure that we kept our, our uh, paper ballots. So there was a push when I was in the legislature to go to all electronic voting. And, that, and we knew back then that it was a problem back in the early 2000s. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to, as a group here that I, uh, I represent with the Arizona Republican Assembly, you know, our goal is to make sure that we hold Republican elected officials and party officials accountable to the party plat or to the Republican platform, which is passed every four years. And we have, uh, you know, we want to make sure that people are are standing tall for protecting our borders, for protecting the laws of our land, for supporting our police, for being pro-life, for being protecting our Second Amendment rights, for protecting our rights to assemble. A lot of people don't realize that these mask mandates and these and some of these social distancing mandates where they shut down churches and they didn't allow people to assemble, that's a pure that is absolutely a violation of our constitution. You did something when you were a legislator. You were involved in expanding undocumented immigration enforcement. You were involved in that as a legislator, and that's way back then. It's a problem today. It is a problem today. And, and so, you know, of course, one of the reasons a lot of uh, illegal immigrants come to this country, aliens come to this country, is for, is for work. Some of them, a lot of them come here for the benefits. I mean, you know, I, and I don't blame people that want to come to the United States. We have the best country in the world. I don't care what the Democrats say, what, what a lot of the uh, Democrat members of Congress just, you know, and what of a lot of our school professors. And that's another thing that we really want to address is, as, in ASRA is, you know, we, the schools are out of control. They're indoctrinating and not teaching. They're not teaching kids. They're not teaching our children how to think. They're telling them what to think. And that's a problem, and, we, and we're seeing this over and over again, and, there, and we're starting to see pushback from parents, which finally is happening because this has been going on for 60 years, and, we, and that's why they're so bold now is because no one has held them accountable. And so we get, it's time to start holding our school boards accountable and our school administrators accountable. You know, when they, when they blatantly stood up, and, and, it started with, and it started with the election integrity, Jay. When the Board of Supervisors told the state legislature, we don't have to follow your rules. Well, you're a subdivision of the state of Arizona. You do, you're not an autonomous, separate organization. You, you follow the rules. That's right. And when they pass laws and they send you subpoenas, you're supposed to obey them. And, and these school administrators and these school boards that said, we're not going to obey the law, they're, they're, that is a criminal act. By definition, and they and they and that needs to be, and and they need to be held accountable. And so, one of the things that we're going to work in, one, I mean, you have you have teachers that are politicizing the classroom. They've been politicizing the classroom in our universities for for years, and now those teachers that went through the universities are going down into their into the K twelve system, and they're politicizing the classroom. And we need to. We need to start holding them accountable so that they are teaching the curriculum that the state of Arizona says you're supposed to teach, not what the AEA or some other union tells them they're going to teach. They are using one other thing that, that fits in today. You authorized the governor to challenge federal health mandates, health care mandates. And today we have health care mandates that 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 don't fit they don't fit so you know so this is what you know the, i love i always found it interesting the cities would come and say well you don't want the federal government telling the states what to do well the difference is our federal system is set up that the federal government derives its power from the states local governments derive their power from the state the state is the ultimate legal authority in the country in the country that's the way our constitution was set up people don't look at it that way and so yeah so when the federal when the federal government, not just health mandates, education mandates. You know, we saw that, that problem. You know, they were mandating stuff to us, and a, lot of the, and a lot of those mandates came unfunded. So not only were they mandating a, them to us, but they weren't providing the funds to, to comply with the mandates. And so, you know, we were tasked with trying to fill budget deficits with either cutting other areas of, of spending or, unfortunately, some people we're supportive of raising taxes, which I've never been supportive of because as far as I'm concerned, government is as big as is bigger than it needs to be already, and we don't need to spend any more money on it. Tom Horn, when he was in office, fought Tucson Unified School District 
and some of the things they were doing, and he won. Yes, and he won. And, and, and you know, too many times I hear elected officials say, well, we have to do this because this is what, you know, this is, if, they, if we don't do it, we're going to lose the funding. Well, we've seen a lot of places where, they, where, where when we stand up and challenge, we actually win. And, and unfortunately, too many of our, our, our career bureaucrats and government administrators, they don't want to stand up and fight. You know, too many of our elected officials don't want to stand up and fight. And so it's, it's important. I mean, I love the fact, I mean, I'm, you know, I live out in the Gilbert area and I have Warren, I have Warren Peterson and I have Strong. Travis Grantham right, and, right. and Jake Hoffman. And they, they're doing such a fantastic job. And I love the job that they're doing, you know. And, you know, and that, and, you know I, that was my district. That was with Eddie Farnsworth and Andy Biggs now, who's in Congress. And so actually, it was kind of interesting. So Andy Biggs and I got elected to the legislature at the same time. We were seatmates the whole time I was in there. He, I was in the Senate and he was in the House. A and then, great legislator. I and, remember, let me tell you one yeah. experience. I was at Andy's house. Judy and I went to Andy's house on election night. Food everywhere. They were going to have this giant Andy will be elected. Mm -hmm. And it came close. The, it was very close. The woman, I don't even remember her name, but she was very close. And we snuck out, left early, when it looked as though Andy might lose. He didn't. Thank and he never goodness. gave up. No, you know, he, never he, he, he never gave up. He never doubted. So, but, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, this, we've been on a path together. We started going to district meetings at the same time back when we were, became precinct committeemen and, and we were neighbors. And so we went to the legislature at the same time and we went back to Washington at the same time. He went back as a congressman and I went back working for the for the Trump administration. So that was that was that was that was pretty nice, you know, to, to be back there while while Andy was in, in Congress. But that yeah. had to be fun being part of the Trump you administration. Know, I, I tell people, people ask me about Washington and I say, you know, I was for me, it was like Mr. Smith goes to Washington every day, uh, you know, to 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 be able to go out at on, on my lunch break and walk around the White House for lunch. Uh, that was pretty fun to see all the wonderful monuments that represent the freedoms and the sacrifices that Americans have made and fought for. And, and, and it just was, you know, it was just a fantastic thing. I mean, yeah, you had this, it was, it, it was swampy. You know, you had the, a lot of resistance to what President Trump was trying to do there, whether it was at, in housing, whether it was in, you know, education, you know, I mean, the president was so in favor of allowing parents to choose the best education options for their children. And, you know, and quite frankly, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, we can't do vouchers. They're unconstitutional. But, you know, we've, we've had vouchers for 75 years. That's what the GI Bill is. The GI Bill is the most successful program in the country, and it's a voucher program. And it allows veterans to choose where they want to go so to I get their education. education. You know, I, I used the GI Bill, too, and I used... You know, I used those benefits, and and I didn't have to. I didn't have to go to the school they told me I had to go to. I could go to any of the accredited institutions uh, that were recognized in the state. And so, and quite frankly, when we did the uh, Choose VA and gave veterans the the choice to go into to private doctors, you know, that was an expansion of the same concept. And those were concepts that we've been fighting for ever since I was in the legislature, because because people will make better choices for themselves. We are going to be discussing ASRA, the Arizona Republican Assembly. And we're going to take a break right now and get ready for that discussion because it's going to, it's going to be an important discussion. You are now president of ASRA and you are working at changing it. Thayer yeah. Vershore is our guest. I'm Jay Lawrence. This is a commercial for an auto dealership. Well, not really. It's a commercial for a salesperson at an auto dealership. The dealership is Wright Toyota on Frank Lloyd Wright. The salesperson is Jason Carter. I want you to remember that name, Jason Carter. My wife and I have bought our last six autos from him. I've sent relatives and friends to see Jason at Wright Toyota. If you're financing, Jason will work with the finance department to get you the lowest payments. Jason, here's what you 
you're looking for. He knows what's there on the grounds. He knows where to find the exact automobile for which you're looking. And there's no time limit to his service. So there's no insistence that you buy the automobile he shows you. If it's a new Toyota or a formerly owned auto, any brand, any label, please call Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. You have a great business, terrific products, outstanding services. So where is everybody? It's simple. They don't know you're here. Why not? We didn't tell them. Well, let me introduce you to the Media Maven. She is the expert in getting your advertising message to the right people in the right places for the right prices. She can make your business a household name. She can make this claim because she's been doing this for years for large and small businesses. You need an expert who knows who to talk to and how to make the best deal for your business. She has the right radio and television contacts for your budget, whatever it is. That's Kathy, the media maven. She can put you on the map, the one that leads to success and prosperity. Call Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. That's Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. An official hello, this is Laura Paxton with the Jay Lawrence Show Disaster Report. An official water shortage has been declared by the federal government for Lake Mead in the lower Colorado River Basin for the first time ever. Total water storage is at 40% capacity, 49, down 49% from last year, a decline. And uh, this for 2022, it's going to be, all the way through, it's going to be in a, uh, in a state of, uh, of shortage. So we we'll expect a lot of, uh, a lot of water cuts and, you know, a lot of conservation coming up soon. And for the, uh, the fires that are burning, the fire, big fire in California, the Dixie Fire, is, is still only 33% contained. And it is the first fire ever to burn across the Sierra Nevada from the western slope down into the eastern floor of the valley. So that's another first. And also last week, in seven days, there were seven 7.0 or greater earthquakes around the earth, which is also a, a pretty, uh, pretty new record. So. <laughs> Make sure you enjoy your life and be grateful for every moment that we have that's peaceful and beautiful. Have a great week. Thank you very much. Are you tired of the long lines and impersonal service you get at the post office? Well, we have a solution for you. Pack Mail is an all in one mail center conveniently located in the Fry Shopping Center at 3218 East Bell Road, right here in Phoenix. Owned and operated by Arizona residents Mark and Vicki Battaglia, you can be sure of getting personalized professional service. They will pack, crate, freight, and ship your items anywhere in the world. They work with all the major carriers like DHL, UPS, USPS, and Federal Express. Need an address for your home business or startup company? They have P.O. Box on site where you can receive and pick up your mail anytime and their knowledgeable and courteous staff will find a way to ship that awkward or heavy item. You can even have your packages picked up and delivered for a small fee. Their motto is, if you can imagine it, we can ship it. Drop in on the good folks at PacMail and let them do the work for you. PacMail can be reached at 602-971-2300 or email at info at weshipphoenix.com. That's PacMail, 602-971-2300 or info at weshipphoenix.com. When it comes to roof work, people ask, Do you know a guy? Let me save you a little time and money. Call me, I'm Lori Clark, owner of Right Way Roofing. Our family started in the roofing business in 1963 on the promise, there's only one way, the right way. We protect your roof with thick, waterproof, rubberized asphalt, not felt paper. So when it's time to repair or replace your roof and you need a guy, I'm your girl. We're Right Way Roofing and we do it right. We'll always keep you watertight. You're watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. Glad you're here with us, the Jay Lawrence Show, our guest Thayer Vershoor. We want to talk about something very important, and that's ASRA, the Arizona Republican Assembly, and Thayer is the new president of ASRA. What? Now, we'd like to say that, that ASRA is the conservative wing of the Republican Party. Expand that. So, when conservative wing, because we're the wing that believes in the party, the Republican platform. Like I said earlier, our, 
our mission is to make sure that our elected Republicans and our party officials adhere to the principles of the Republican platform. And so ASRA or was formed in about 1994 with some some good good people, good freedom loving people who believed in the Constitution, who believed in the in the Republican platform that Reagan had established in 1994 here, like like Barbara Bluster, who served in the legislature, a, a good guy named Leo Mahoney, and a, and a group of other folks that worked really hard to to get it started. It started in California in about 1934. Uh, as the Republican Assembly and the, Rep and the Republican Assembly ASRA is part of a network a national organization called the National Federation of Republican Assemblies and there's about 23 states right now that have Republican Assemblies chartered in them and there's about three three new states that are about ready to come on board so we'll have about 25 26 states here probably by the end of the year that are, are um, part of the Republican Assembly so uh, I got really active in the Republican Assembly back in the in the 90s uh, after I got out of the army and moved back here back to Arizona to go to school and and start my life here back in 1986 and uh, I got involved in in politics I, I kind of grew up as a politician kid my, my my mom was the mayor of my little tent the little town I I grew up in called Welton and while I was in high school my dad served on the school board that was kind of an interesting experience and uh, my and my mother was a, as, was our history and civics teacher when I was in junior high. So I had to I had her for my teacher. So I, I don't recommend that necessarily having your parent for your teacher in school is, Be is tough the best getting thing. Getting a bad grade <laughs> from your mom. Well, it was tough for getting a good grade actually. Right, right. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but anyhow, um, so you know, I, I when I got out of the army, uh, we the. Uh, the vision commander brought us all into uh, the, the, the chapel there at the, in the, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, and he said, look, and he made this statement, and, I, and probably because of my upbringing, he said, when you go home, he goes, I encourage all of you to get involved politically. He goes, right now, we, there's only a handful of members of Congress that have ever served in the military, and they're making all these decisions. And you got to remember, in the early 80s, we were just coming off of the you know the debacle in in uh, in in Iran you know with President Carter right. and, and of course and that was preceded by the debacle in Vietnam which we're there are shades of that now that we're seeing in Afghanistan unfortunately I think a lot of Americans are very upset about you know the the American blood that seems to have been spilled needlessly now that we've just abandoned Afghanistan the way we did uh, so anyhow. You know, I got involved in politics when I got out, you know, and and um, got involved in the Republican Assembly back back in the in the late 90s as I got more involved in politics. Then after I got out of the legislature, I I got back involved in the Republican Assembly again and became the president actually before I started working on the Trump campaign. And we had built up to several chapters across the state and, and we had almost 500 members. Uh, I kind of when I left to go back there, I didn't stay involved and in, engaged in it, and and you know I think unfortunately Those 500 members dissipated. Well, they, by the way, you know, I, and and this is kind of what ha what we see this happening whether whether it was the Tea Party movement, whether it was the Moral Majority back in the, you know back when uh, uh, when Evan Meekham ran for governor, yes. and you know there was a lot of people that got really activated and engaged, and then. After after a year or two, they disengage, you know, and so that that that's a that's one of the things that we're going to work on is we've got as conservatives and as people who love our Constitution and believe that this is a nation under God whose whose hand inspired our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, you know, we have to stay engaged because when we're not engaged, it creates a vacuum, and that vacuum is more than happily filled by 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 our by our, the opposition. And so, you know, and, and that's kind of what happened, you know, they, we came in, President Trump won, and a lot of people were highly engaged. And then after the, after the victory, they were like, hey, our job is done, we can go back home, because conservatives, they don't work in government. They work in pr the private sector. They have, their, they have their own businesses. They have jobs that they, they, they go to. 
you know, where we see so many times the left, their, their, their business is government. That's what they want to do. They want to grow government. They want to be in government. They want to make government bigger. They want to do everything. It's the nanny state, right? They want to do everything for everybody. They want to make your choices for you because you're not smart enough to make your own choices. That's the problem with the left. You know, they, and so they stay engaged because that's, that's what they, that's their goal. And, and conservatives just want to be left alone to be able to, to go about, raise their family and, 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 and grow their businesses. Mayor, how do you keep conservatives involved in Ezra? How, how do you get elected officials? How do you get leadership? There is a, a whole, a cadre, if you will, of people that you must get involved. How do you do that? Well, I, I think education is an important thing, and, and we're seeing that now. I mean, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, social media, even though right now the big tech social media are trying to sh shut down conservative voices and censor us, you know, that's actually been a beneficial in getting people engaged because people are seeing the disparity in, in liberty from what the left thinks and versus what the what Republicans and what conservatives think. And so we're actually seeing more people starting to get engaged again because they're seeing their liber liberties are being eroded. They're seeing the foundational things of government that we've trusted in for years not being trustworthy anymore. Things like our elections, things like our schools. And there and that's problematic there. And so, you know, and so one of the things that we have to do is we have to engage people, but and, and not just engage them, but we have to educate them to show them what they can do to make a difference, how they can become what precinct commitment. conservatism? How do you tell people, here's what we believe? There's a, a constitution in which we believe. So, you know, and, and that's, that's an important thing. You know, actually, in Title 15, our schools are required to, to post in their classrooms a flag, right. a constitution, and declaration of independence. They're supposed to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance every day in, in, K, in, in grades 4 through 12. The question is, is are the schools doing it? Because they've already demonstrated they're more than willing to disobey the law and, ign and ignore um, what, the, what the state has, has passed in statute that they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, and that was what I was talking about a little bit earlier. The biggest problem is that, you know, we see people get engaged at the congressional level, at the statewide level, at, at the legislative level, but they don't get as engaged in our city and town council races. They don't get engaged in our school boards. And quite frankly, you know, we've allowed the school boards to be taken over by the unions. And, and, and that's who's running a lot of our school boards. And that's why they're so willing to ignore state law because that doesn't, that doesn't go along with their agenda. And we have, to start being, we have to start teaching people how they get engaged in those elections and how to run for office. Because that's what the left does all the time. You have a law. Yeah. There are laws that cover the things about which you're, you're speaking. The governor enforces the law. Is the government, the governor doing his job? So one of the things that ASRA does, different than what most organizations, like most Republican clubs, you know, they kind of greet me and they, they allow a pl place for candidates to come and talk to constituents and to get signatures, and those things are important. But one of the things that ASRA does that is different from clubs or even the Republican Party organization itself is we will endorse in the primary. So we'll be holding an endorsement convention in May in which we, what 60%, if you get 60% of the membership's vote, you, you will receive an endorsement from the Arizona Republican Assembly that you can use in your election to, to show because, our, and to get that, we're gonna have a candidate's pledge that's, and, and part of that pledge is gonna be talking about, do you support securing our borders? Do you support building the wall? Do you support you know, allowing medical freedom to choose rather to, uh, to prohibit these mask and vaccine ma mandates? Do you support uh, election integrity laws? So those are, those are some important things that we're gonna be saying, if you, want our, if you want our support and you want our endorsement, you're gonna have to do that. And then, and then we'll, we're gonna, you're gonna have to take this pledge saying that. And then we're gonna, we're gonna show people the ones who have taken that pledge and the ones who haven't taken that pledge, because that's one of the things that's really different about the Republican Assembly is we're going to be proactive. We're not just going to wait till the primary is over because in too many legislative districts, in too many lower races, and as well as in sometimes in the state race, 
the the primary is this, the winner of the of the general election is decided in the primary. Right. Our guest is Thayer Vershoor. I'm Jay Lawrence, and I welcome you. Thank you so much for being part of our program. This is a commercial for an auto dealership. Well, not really. It's a commercial for a salesperson at an auto dealership. The dealership is Wright Toyota on Frank Lloyd Wright. The salesperson is Jason Carter. I want you to remember that name, Jason Carter. My wife and I have bought our last six autos from him. I've sent relatives and friends to see Jason at Wright Toyota. If you're financing, Jason will work with the finance department to get you the lowest payments. Jason, here's what you're looking for. He knows what's there on the grounds. He knows where to find the exact automobile for which you're looking. And there's no time limit to his service. So there's no insistence that you buy the automobile he shows you. If it's a new Toyota or a formerly owned auto, any brand, any label, please call Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. You have a great business, terrific products, outstanding services. So where is everybody? It's simple. They don't know you're here. Why not? We didn't tell them. Well, let me introduce you to the Media Maven. She is the expert in getting your advertising message to the right people in the right places for the right prices. She can make your business a household name. She can make this claim because she's been doing this for years for large and small businesses. You need an expert who knows who to talk to and how to make the best deal for your business. She has the right radio and television contacts for your budget, whatever it is. That's Kathy, the media maven. She can put you on the map, the one that leads to success and prosperity. Call Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. That's Kathy, the media maven at 602-524-0947. Are you tired of the long lines and impersonal service you get at the post office? Well, we have a solution for you. Pack Mail is an all-in-one mail center conveniently located in the Fry Shopping Center at 3218 East Bell Road, right here in Phoenix. Owned and operated by Arizona residents Mark and Vicki Battaglia, you can be sure of getting personalized professional service. They will pack, crate, freight, and ship your items anywhere in the world. They work with all the major carriers like DHL, UPS, USPS, and Federal Express. Need an address for your home business or startup company? They have P.O. Box is on site where you can receive and pick up your mail anytime and their knowledgeable and courteous staff will find a way to ship that awkward or heavy item. You can even have your packages picked up and delivered for a small fee. Their motto is, if you can imagine it, we can ship it. Drop in on the good folks at PacMail and let them do the work for you. PacMail can be reached at 602-971-2300 or email at info at weshipphoenix.com. That's PacMail, 602-971-2300 or info at weshipphoenix.com. When it comes to roof work, people ask, do you know a guy? Let me save you a little time and money. Call me. I'm Lori Clark, owner of Right Way Roofing. Our family started in the roofing business in 1963 on the promise, there's only one way, the right way. We protect your roof with thick, waterproof, rubberized asphalt, not felt paper. So when it's time to repair or replace your roof and you need a guy, I'm your girl. We're right Way Roofing and we do it right. We'll always keep you watertight. You're watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. I'm Jay Lawrence. I'm glad you're here with us this evening. Our guest, Thayer Vershoor, president of the ASRA, Arizona Republican Assembly. And we're talking about the Republican Assembly and how we get elected officials, uh, leadership generally. How do you get down to the grassroots? Because that's where the power is. So a couple of things. So I talked about our endorsement uh, that we do. I talk about the, the pledge that we're going to take. One of the other things that we do is we do a legislative scorecard. And so what we like to do with that scorecard is it grades the legislature real time when they're, after they make votes, take votes on the floor and in committees. Right. Not just the flow votes, but we also include in that score the committee votes. Uh, because as, as a legislature, you know, a lot of games are played with votes in committees. So I don't even want to think about <laughs> it. <laughs> so, you know, so we, we want to make sure that 
you know, bad legislation needs to be killed at the committee level if it, if it, you know, before it even gets to the floor, and then hopefully it, it doesn't make it through the floor. So that's so that's one of the things. And then that scorecard, we want to make sure it gets out to all the legislative districts, all the or clubs and organizations. You know, anybody who any of the, you know, now with social media, there's so many folks out there that are are will put stuff out that we want to share that with them so that people see how their legislator is actually doing. The other thing that's important, one of the things I've always pushed for is that we want every member of ASRA to be a precinct committeeman. They don't have to be, that's not a membership requirement. And, that is another, that, and that's another thing which I'll talk about. But we also want every precinct committeeman to be a member of ASRA. So every ASRA member, a precinct committeeman, every precinct committeeman, a member of ASRA. So, and the other thing that's different about ASRA than other clubs is you, you can't just join. You know, when you join the Re Arizona Republican Assembly, you're saying that you pledge to support the principles of the Republican platform of the U.S. Constitution. And so even our own members have to take a pledge to support those things. And then, you know, it's, all, it's about getting out, getting out the vote. It's getting people out to vote. It's t educating people on who, who's running. And so those are the kind of things that we do to get down to that grassroots level. And, and again, like, again I, like I said, you know, we're losing the culture war in this country because we've lost control of our schools and our school boards. And we're going to focus really in on electing school board members because I think that's going to be the real fight for the future. Judy and I went to a meeting. My wife Judy and I went to a meeting maybe three weeks ago. Right. And you had a really good crowd at the meeting, people interested in Ezra. How are you setting up more of those meetings? You know, so one of the things I like to do is I like to really kind of hold informal meetings because, you know, people like to like to come and, and, and be engaged. They don't like to come and be spoken to. They, people, have, people have real concerns that they need to, they want to express and they want to, and they want to find out what other people are doing to address those same concerns, whether it's the schools, whether it's mask and vaccine mandates, whether it's, you know, closing down their businesses. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we saw too many businesses go out of business with, in 2020, yes. you know, because of these, you know, these unconstitutional federal edicts, you know, and, and state edicts. I mean, you know, and the president really allowed the governors to do that, but there's way too many governors. And so you got, and, and the governors have a lot of power in these states and they, and they shut down too many businesses for too long. And so, so you know, people are, people are energized right now because a lot of people lost their jobs, you know, and so, you know, uh, I'm a big David Horowitz fan, I don't, you, know, sure. you know, and he wrote the book, book called The Art of Political Warfare, and he said people are motivated by two things, fear and hope, and, and David Horowitz was raised by communist parents, and that's exactly how the left operates. They create fear, and then they create the white charger to come in, the, you know, the, the, I'm the one who's going to save the day. You know, and so that's, you know, that's what they do. And so, unfortunately, you know, we see too much of this game being played. But people are motivated for hope and fear. And right now, you know, they, they're afraid of if they haven't lost their job, are they going to lose their job? You know, especially now they're starting to talk about variants. I mean, now not only was the vaccine not good enough, but now you got to get the third dose and the, the fourth third, dose. Right. It's you know, and so when is it going to end? To me. Yeah, when is it going to end? <clears throat> and so people are people are fed up with being told how to live their lives, what to think, what to say, what to eat, what to drink. You know, you you know, and so you know, educating and teaching people. And, and people don't even trust what they're being told anymore. I mean, you know, you, you, everything, everything is, is people just are so tired of how they're being treated by their government, by their representatives, that they're, they're engaging now. They're engaging, they're pushing back. And, and quite frankly, one of the encouraging thing is, is we're seeing that happen with the, with the youth. There is, there, the youth are, you know, they're rebelling against this, this, this uh, oppressive tide of, of socialism I that's sweeping across the country. Yet. I haven't seen that. You know, I, I, let, me yet. let me tell you what. I saw that when I was in D.C. 
So my office was right across from the White House, and Lafayette Park was right there. And I'm telling you, all the time, I would go out to the park during my lunch break, and there would be 14, 15 high school age, college age students out there, young men and women out there wearing, you know, Make America Great Again, you know, wearing Trump, you know, 2020 stuff. So there were, there were a lot of, of young people that were supporting that. And, and, and you know, that was really witnessed uh, with the young man from Kentucky where, that was assaulted out there on, right. on that square. And, and, and fortunately, he sued uh, a couple of the network stations, which absolutely lied, the news agencies that absolutely lied. And, and quite frankly, the people don't trust the media anymore. They, 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 they have an agenda, and they will say whatever it takes to, to pass their agenda. And so that's motivated a lot of people to really get engaged and to find out and to educate themselves. You know, what bothers me, I would like to see people involved. I would like to see grassroots involved and people who get angry and say, this is not going to happen to me. And yet we see the media, and you mentioned it, saying that we're losing. They're saying that the conservative cause is is dead, and I think that that will just innervate the conservative cause. Well, I, and I think that that's where it's backfired on them, Jay. Because I, I agree with you. That is exactly that's exactly what the left wants to do. That's been that's been going back into into the 1915 and 17s when Marx started his ideological rants. You know that they when they took over Russia. That's what they did is they pushed saying, we're, you're losing, we're winning, give up, surrender. You know, unfortunately, we saw that happen this, this in, in, in Afghanistan where the government just fled the country, didn't stay and fight. And, you know, and we, see, and, we, and we saw that happen. I mean, so, you know, we stepped up and we went into the Middle East, at, you know, when, when President Bush was the president to support those allies of ours. We, we have to continue to do that. But the fact of the matter is I think people are starting to recognize we're not the minority. We are the majority. I mean, Jerry Falwell used to call it the silent majority right, because, right. yeah, we're not, we don't want to go out there and we don't want to ha have protests and we don't want to burn and tear down statues and, and federal buildings. We don't want to do that. And that's what, the, that's what the, the left did with Antifa and all, all of those crazy protests out there. And assault, you know, they talk about assaulting police. Where, were, where, was, where was Pelosi and where was... The Democrat leadership, when they were assaulting the police, they were talking about, we want to defund the police. Well, ASRA supports our police. We don't want to defund them. We, we support the rule of law. That's what gives us our freedoms. And if ASRA can support funds for police, Absolutely. ASRA will do that. We, we want to support funds for police. We want to support our military. And we want to support freedom-loving citizens all across the country. And quite frankly, Ronald Reagan said it best. America is the last hope, the last light of freedom in the world. If the light of freedom and liberty is extinguished here in the United States, that it will, be, it will go out in, across the world. Trump accomplished a great deal. Yes. And what he has done is now being torn apart. So what you saw President Trump, I mean, he was the most pro-life president we ever had. Right. But he ended the caliphate. He, a lot of people tend to overlook that. He did the Abraham Accords. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He did so many wonderful things to bring peace to the Middle East and, and was doing it. I mean, that, the, the, that brutality was stopping where they were beheading Christians. And so, yeah, you know, he, he did those things. And, and so, you know, I think I really look forward to seeing a Trump candidacy. A great example of what I'm talking about is the fact that he closed the border. He closed the border. Illegals he built the were wall. no longer entering, and now it's a flood. Right. So now you're seeing the caliphates rising again in the Middle East, and you're seeing that the, the debacle on the border. You know, the first thing that um, the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration did was to stop enforcing the law and allowing those people to come in, the catch and release policy that, that was occurring under Obama to start happening again. Because under the president, those people were stopped before they came into America, and they had to stay in Mexico until they could prove that they were, they, they were allowed to come in the United States. Thayer, let me thank you very much for joining us. Um, 
next week, Sheriff Joe Arpaio will be on the show. Now there, great guy. There's our guest. I love Sheriff. I love I the Sheriff. He's my sheriff. sheriff. When the Sheriff is on, I can just say, "Hi, Sheriff. I'll go have dinner, and I'll come back in an hour." Good night, everybody. Good Thank night. you for joining us. Thanks, there. <laughs>